Good evening, Saints. Good to see everyone. Uh, just as a reminder, so this will be our last Wednesday meeting until January. So uh, we'll resume then, but we won't meet uh, until January on Wednesday nights. Okay, so we're going to start with some questions. A, a bunch of folks submitted questions in advance. Thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. So we'll start with the first question. What kind of judgment is Paul speaking about in 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 5? So let's turn to 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 5, and we'll look at it. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment, Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God." Well, as you look at that passage, what judgment is it talking about? It has to be the judgment seat of Christ. So what are the clues that, that tell you that? So look at verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time, and then what does it say? Until the Lord come. Well, what judgment occurs when the Lord comes? The judgment seat of Christ. So the body of Christ is caught up at the rapture, and after the rapture, the body of Christ goes through the judgment seat of Christ. Then if you keep reading, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, it then says, and then shall every man have praise of God. So every man has praise of God at this judgment. Is that the great white throne? It's not the great white throne. So the judgment that's being described in 1 Corinthians 4 verses 3 through 5 is the judgment seat of Christ. And that, of course, makes perfect sense because we're in 1 Corinthians 4. What judgment do we learn a lot about in 1 Corinthians 3? The judgment seat of Christ, right? So 1 Corinthians 3, verses 10 through 15 is a description of the judgment seat of Christ, and that's what's being talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Next question pertains to 1 Corinthians 7, verses 36 and 37. So 1 Corinthians 7, verses 36 and 37, and the question is, is are those verses talking about the father of the virgin that's being described. So look at verse 36. But if any man think that he behaveth himself uncomely toward his virgin, if she pass the flower of her age, and need so require, let him do what he will, he sinneth not, let them marry. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but hath power over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin, doeth well. So the question is, who's the person here that's, that's being referred to? Is it the father of the virgin? So look at verse 38. So he that giveth her in marriage. Well, doesn't that, an, that I think that tells you the, the answer to it, right? So then he that giveth her in marriage doeth well, but he that giveth her not in marriage doeth better. So the answer to that question is, I think it is the, indeed the father of the virgin. I think verse 38 confirms that. So moving right along, we'll take the next question. Does the Bible say that prophecy and mystery can or can't exist at the same time? Is there a period of coexistence from Acts 7 to 13, 
or is it clear cut when Israel falls in Acts 7? Well, let's think about that. Does the mystery exist in Acts chapter 7, or put it this way, is the, d did the dispensation of grace exist or begin in Acts chapter 7? And the answer is it couldn't have, because the dispensation of grace can't begin be before the Apostle Paul is saved. So how should we think about this? If you think about the book of Acts, it is true that the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God are both preached at the same time. Can anyone think of a verse that would prove that or a passage that would prove that? So when you think about Acts chapter 15 or Galatians 2, Paul and the 12 come to an agreement, don't they? Look with me at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 is a description of some things that take place in Acts chapter 15. So as you recall, in Acts chapter 15, Paul runs into a dispute with some folks and they say that the Gentiles have to be circumcised to be saved. Paul says, absolutely not. To settle it, Paul takes Titus and he goes up to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 and he meets with the 12. So look with me at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So the twelve recognized that what God did is he committed the gospel of the uncircumcision to Paul, just as God had committed the gospel of the circumcision unto Peter. Each of them was given a gospel of God. They were different gospels, but each one was entrusted with one. Verse 8, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. So Peter and Paul have different apostleships. Now notice verse 9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So in looking at that, let me ask you a question. Do Peter and Paul's ministries coexist at the same time? The answer is yes. They give him the right hand of the fellowship and the right hand of fellowship and they say to him, Paul, you go to whom? The uncircumcision, and Peter and the twelve will go to the circumcision. Those ministries both operated at the exact same time. Now let's talk about this just for a minute. Peter had the gospel of the circumcision. The gospel of the circumcision consisted of what two gospels? Well, Peter preached the gospel of the kingdom, didn't he? Repent and be baptized for, for the remission of sins. After the cross, Peter also preached the gospel of God, that Jesus Christ was proved to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. So when Peter would preach after the cross, he would preach the gospel of God and the gospel of the kingdom. Scripture co collectively calls that the gospel of the circumcision. Paul preached both the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ. Scripture refers to that as the gospel of the uncircumcision. So during the book of Acts, Peter and Paul's ministries were both in effect at the same time. Whose ministry would last longer? Paul's, right? So when you think about the book of Acts, what do you see? You see what is known as the fall and diminishing of Israel. So what God did in time past is Israel 
was exalted above Gentiles, Israel had direct access to God. What happens during the Acts period is the fall and diminishing of Israel, and that takes place beginning in Acts chapter 7 with the stoning of Stephen. Why does the fall begin in Acts chapter 7? It's Acts chapter 7 when Israel has rejected the third person of the Godhead. In the Old Testament, God the Father sent prophets again and again and again to Israel. And what was Israel's response? Stone them. Then the Father sent the Son, because surely they will regard the Son. What is Israel's response to God the Son? They kill him. What does God do in the early part of the book of Acts? He bestows the gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 7, Stephen, speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, testifies unto Israel. And so what do they do? They stone him. So as of Acts 7, Israel has rejected all three persons of the Godhead. And what should follow in short order is the end times, the 70th week, and so on. So Israel diminishes. And what, what God does as a result of that is he, he concludes Israel in unbelief like Gentiles, concludes Israel in unbelief like Gentiles so that he can have mercy upon them all during the dispensation of grace. So let me then make, make this point. So Peter and Paul's ministries coexist for a period of time. Peter's ministry is going to cease because God stops putting people into the kingdom church. Anyone that's saved today, 2022, how do they have to be saved? They have to be saved by Paul's gospel. And if they're saved by Paul's gospel, they're placed into the body of Christ, not into the kingdom church. Let me then take up this question. Can prophecy be fulfilled during the dispensation of grace? So what most prophecy teachers do today is they look at current events. They often look at things in the Middle East. They look at you know, current events. They look at governmental things. They look at wars and other things. And they often view those items as the fulfillment of some prophecy in the Old Testament. As one example, the year 1948 is often viewed as a fulfillment of Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 talks about God the Father regathering Israel into the land. So when people look at 1948 and the creation of the modern nation state of Israel, they say, aha, it's the fulfillment of prophecy. However, no prophecy can be fulfilled during the dispensation of grace, and here's why. If we hide the dispensation of grace for a second, the Lord taught during His earthly ministry, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. Well, did that generation, in fact, pass away? It did. They're not here. They're dead. A generation in the Bible is 40 years, but even if you don't believe that, even if you think a generation is 80 years, or even if you think a generation is 200 years, which it isn't, did that generation pass away? That generation passed away, and the things referenced in the gospel were not all fulfilled. Why is that? Well, the reason is what God did, the prophetic timeline, if you, right before the cross, drew the timeline of Scripture, it would look exactly like what we're looking at right now. But what God did, because He did not want to pour out His wrath at that time, He inserted the dispensation of grace. And the dispensation of grace acted as an interruption 
a time out in the prophetic program. Therefore, can any event today be a fulfillment of the Old Testament prophetic program? No, because the dispensation of grace by its nature is an interruption. It's a holding off of the prophetic program. All right. Let's look next at the next question. According to Acts 3, the sins of Israel will be blotted out in the future at the second coming of Jesus. What about Peter? Are his sins already blotted out or not? Does Peter need also to wait till the second coming for the remission of sins or for forgiveness of sins? So let's get Acts chapter 3, and we'll look at verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Now the key part of verse 19 that this question is wondering about, it says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted... Why? That your sins may be blotted out. And then it says, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So some will say that Israel did not have forgiveness at that point in time. And what they had to do is they had to wait for the second coming. And that's the point in time at which they would receive forgiveness of sins. Now, I don't personally believe that. And I've sort of, over the years, I've thought different things about this verse. And I'll, here's, I'll tell you here what I currently understand. Verse 19 does describe Israel's sins being blotted out at the second coming. And I understand that to be a fulfillment of the Old Testament Day of Atonement. So here's what I mean by that. As you think about the Old Testament feasts, the Old Testament feasts foreshadow a fulfillment of that feast. So for example, Acts 2 is the day of Pentecost. Acts 2 is the fulfillment of a Levitical feast called the Feast of Weeks. So when Leviticus was written and the Feast of Weeks was given, Israel would celebrate that, or at least was supposed to celebrate that, for years and years and years and years. And then it would ultimately find a fulfillment. They were still doing it the whole time, but it would find a fulfillment in Acts 2 when the day of Pentecost occurred. Well, the same thing, Leviticus talks of a day of atonement that Israel had to observe year after year after year. And what it did is it foreshadowed a future day of atonement that is going to take place at the second coming. Get with me Revelation 13, verse 8. Revelation 13, verse 8. And what we want to do here is we want to notice some things about how God uses language. Revelation 13, verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life, notice this, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Well, who's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world? It's obviously Jesus Christ. 
was Jesus Christ slain at the foundation of the world? In other words, when the foundation of the world occurred, was Jesus Christ slain at that moment in time? Well, not really, because we know He's not slain until the cross occurs. So why does Scripture say He was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world? The answer to that, I believe, is that God knew that Jesus Christ was going to be slain, and He knew that from the foundation of the world. He knew that from eternity past, right? He, that was information that He always knew and understood. And so, in God's mind, Jesus Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, even though the actual event would not occur until some time later. But did God look at it and know of the, of the fact of, of the certainty of its occurrence? He did. So get with me Genesis 15, verse 6. Genesis 15 and verse 6. Genesis 15 is about Abram. Genesis 15, 6. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So what God did with Abram, when Abram believed God, God counted his faith for righteousness. Now think about that just for a minute. Had Jesus Christ already died for Abraham's sins at that point? The answer is no, it was future. But did God have full confidence and knowledge that that sacrifice would occur, that it would pay for Abraham's sins? And so when, Abraham, when Abram had faith in God, what did God do at that moment? He didn't say, Abram, you're going to have to wait. And if there's a sufficient sacrifice for your sins, then I'll count you righteous. He did not say that. What he said was, when Abram had faith, what did God do immediately? He counted it for righteousness because God was fully aware, fully confident, certain of the future sacrifice that Jesus Christ would make, and he therefore counted him righteous at that time. Get with me Leviticus chapter 4. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 20. Leviticus chapter 4 and verse 20. And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this. And the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. Let's read verse 26. And he shall burn all his fat upon the altar as the fat of the sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. So think about this with me. Leviticus 4, and there's other verses that say this in Leviticus as well. Leviticus 4 says the priest can make an atonement, and when he does, it shall be forgiven him. But doesn't Hebrews say that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin? So how is, Le is Leviticus 4 wrong? Because Hebrews clearly says the blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin. And yet what's happening in Leviticus 4 is it's the blood of bulls and goats that are being offered as a payment for sin. So which verse is wrong? The correct answer is neither verse is wrong. What's happening in Leviticus 4 is that when the priests make those offerings for atonement, and it says, it shall be forgiven, what did God do? He saw the priest and, and, the, and the, the, the person that was offering the sacrifice, he saw them acting in faith. 
And just like he did with Abram, what did he do? He counted their faith for righteousness. He forgave them because what did he know? He absolutely knew that Jesus Christ was going to subsequently come and make the perfect offering for sin. Get Romans 4, verse 17. Romans chapter 4. Romans 4 and verse 17. Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead. Now notice this. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. Can God look at things and know exactly what's going to happen and treat it as having occurred in his mind? He can. He can and he does. If that weren't the case, he he could never have said to Abraham that that he could have never have described him as having his faith counted for righteousness. But he did because he knew exactly what was going to happen. So what does this all mean? So There is a day of atonement at the second coming that is when it is the fulfillment of the Old Testament Levitical day of atonement. So that event has to take place. But does God have to wait for that event to take place before he declares someone forgiven? He doesn't. Here's what we're used to doing in human affairs. In human affairs, You wait for something to actually happen before you say that it will. Because what happens often in human affairs? People don't do what they say. They change their mind. There's some reason it can't happen, and so plans just go astray. God has perfect knowledge of what's going to happen, so he can treat things as having occurred before they occur. We'll go on to the next question. Yes. Question is how do, how does that square with Matthew 24:13 and verses that talk about enduring to the end? So the way to to think about that I think is when you think about 1 John. So get 1 John, and uh, let's look at verse... Look at 1 John 2, verse 19. 1 John 2, 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So think about this just for a minute. When Israel came out of Egypt at the Exodus... Was everyone within Israel a believer? The answer is no. There were some that weren't. When people flee to the wilderness, to the mountains, during the 70th week, will everyone who flees be a believer? No. Let me ask you another question. If you take a a visible church, a local church, is everyone in that church a believer? You'd hope so. You'd wish it to be the case, but is it the case? If you take any random large meeting of any group of people, sadly, there's going to be people that are not saved in that group. So what 1 John 2.19 tells you is this. The process that happens during the 70th week, are there folks that appear to be part of the little flock? They're in the same location. They're co-located with them. They're part of the group. 
But are there some in the group that don't believe? Yes. And they went out from us. Why? Because they were not of us. So let me put it this way. When, when, when the little flock flees to the mountains, there are people in that group that aren't believers. Does God know who they are? Yes. Do the members of the little flock necessarily know who they are? No. God knows. God always knows. The folks within the group may or may not know. Some of them are going to depart from it. Now, let me ask you this question. If you think about Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He's not asked to sacrifice Isaac until after that. So did Abraham become righteous when he sacrificed Isaac or was he already righteous? He already was. See, what happens is there are, when someone has faith, God counts it for righteousness at that time in the mind of God. Okay? He knows they're righteous. Did God know in Genesis 15 that Abraham would subsequently obey him when he was asked to sacrifice Isaac? He did. God knew Abraham was, had faith, and therefore... God counted it to him for righteousness long before he ever sacrificed Isaac. So think about this for, with me then. When it, says, when it says, those that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Is God up there watching and saying, this is so interesting. I'm going to watch and I'm going to see which ones endure. And the ones that endure, then I'll know that they had faith and I'll save them. Is that what he's doing? No, because he already knows. Do they have to endure? Yes, because if you don't endure, what does it mean? It means you went out from us because you were what? Not of us. See what I'm saying? The moment you have faith, God counts it for righteousness. So what, what happens is under the if you think of the 70th week, people need to endure because if they don't endure, it means they were never of us. So let's go to the next question. Get with me. Here, here's the next question. Can you please explain what the measure of faith is in Romans 12, verse 3? My Calvinist friends use that verse to say that faith is a gift from God. So let's turn to Romans 12, verse 3, and we're going to consider the issue of, is faith a gift from God? So look at Romans 12, verse 3. For I say through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man, the measure of faith. And so some say, well, God gave you faith and he didn't give other people faith. And so faith is a gift from God. Well, what is Romans 12 verse 3 actually talking about? Is Romans 12 verse 3 talking about people getting saved by faith? Well, let's read verse 4. For as we have many members in one body... And all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophecy according to the proportion of faith. See how proportion of faith matches up with measure of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, and so on. What Romans 12, 3 is about is it is about spiritual gifts. So Romans 12, 3 is written in Acts chapter 20. Did the body of Christ have spiritual gifts at that time? 
The answer is yes. Think about 1 Corinthians. Don't the Corinthians have spiritual gifts? And doesn't Paul teach that there are different spiritual gifts and that different people are given different spiritual gifts? What Romans 12, 3 is about is it says that God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And when you read the context, it's very clear that what he did is he gave spiritual gifts and he gave different spiritual gifts to different people. The issue in Romans 12 is not about saving faith. Get with me Acts chapter 16, verse 30. Now, I want you to think of something with me, if you would. If faith is a gift from God, well, let me just find this verse real quick. Yeah, so get Acts, we're going to go to Acts 16 in a minute, but get Acts 17, verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So what God has done is he has commanded all men to repent. Repentance, repentance is a change of heart. When he's commanded all men to repent, what, is he, what does that actually mean? What has he commanded all men to do today? To believe the gospel. Well, think about this with me just for a minute. If God says to all men, and it says all men everywhere in that verse, if he says to all men everywhere, you need to repent and you need to believe the gospel, and then he gives some of them but not all of them, the gift of faith. What a jerk. Imagine saying to all of humanity, you all need to believe the gospel, and I'll give you faith and you faith and you faith, but not you and not you. What a terrible thing to do. Look with me at Acts 16. There is no verse that says faith is a gift. That, that's just ridiculous. Look at Acts 16, verse 30. The Philippian jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? A completely sincere question. He wants to know the answer. Paul says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. So the Philippian jailer says to Paul, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He, he, is, he is asking because he wants to know. He wants to be saved. And they say to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be. Imagine telling someone that God hasn't given the gift of faith. Just believe and you'll be saved. That is insulting. It is the same thing as if I go to a person that's in a wheelchair and I tell them, stand up and walk. What are you, lazy? Stand up and walk, lazy bones. It, it, it's insulting. It's mocking. It is absurd. God is a just God. He is a fair God. He is a loving God. If faith was a gift, by the way, how many people does God want to be saved? He wants all men to be saved. So if faith is a gift from God, who would he give the gift of faith to? Everyone, because he wants everyone to be saved. The fact of the matter is, faith is a choice. You know what determines whether or not you believe the gospel? You do. You decide. You either choose in your inner man to believe the gospel or you don't, but it's not because you have the gift of faith. It's, because, it's, it's a choice of your will whether or not you believe the gospel. Look with me at Revelation twenty two seventeen. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 
17. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. This next sentence is one of my favorite sentences in the entire Bible. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What a beautiful sentence. You know the way salvation works? God has made the water of life available. How much does it cost? Nothing. It's free. Well, I bet it must be hard to get right? It must be tricky. And you have to do a whole bunch of things to earn it. No. What does it say? Whosoever will, anyone that wants it, can take the water of life freely. Well, don't tell me that faith is a gift that God has to give you. It doesn't work that way. The way that salvation works is the water of life is available to everyone, and all they have to do is they have to choose to take it. They just have to have the will to take the water of life. That's all it is. That's how salvation works. So look at Ephesians 2.8. Ephesians 2, chapter 8. For by grace... Are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves? It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so, yes, some will say, well, the gift of God there is faith. No, the gift of God there is grace. What God has done is, if I were hiring you to do a job, to paint a fence, to fix a car, whatever it is, you would have to perform those works to earn the payment. And if you didn't perform those works, then you didn't earn the payment. The whole point of Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is the way that salvation works or the way that salvation operates is it's, what does verse 9 say? It's not of works. Well, if it's not of works, then it must be of a gift. And so what it's talking about there is salvation. Salvation is a gift. So next question, how does Acts 13.48 relate to election when it says, as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed? So get Acts 13.48. And we'll, we'll read the verse and then we'll talk about what it means. Acts 13, 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So some look at that and they say, well, here's what happened. God ordained a and B and C to eternal life, but not D, E, and F, and so only those ones that God ordained to eternal life believed. Now, the way they read that verse, though, is they believe in, a Calvinist would, unconditional election. You, but not you, for no reason at all. God picked one and rejected the other. That's not what's going on here. What's going on is God ordained to save those that believe. God desires to save everyone, but he will only save those who believe. Let me show you this. Get 1 Corinthians 1, verse 21. First Corinthians 1, verse 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God 
by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Here's what's going on there. If God wanted, he could have said, here's what I'll do. I will save everyone that donates $1 to charity. And that's the way that salvation will work. If anyone donates $1 to charity, I will save them. God could have chosen to save people that way. But why didn't he save people that way? Because God wanted a gospel that excludes boasting. If God chose to save people on the basis of people giving $1 to charity, you know how many people would be saved? An awful lot, right? And yes, and some would say, I gave $3, so I'm really, I'm really special. I deserve the best seat in heaven. God chose a plan of salvation that excluded boasting. Faith excludes boasting, according to Romans 3.27. So when it says, as many as were ordained to eternal life, that doesn't mean that God randomly and arbitrarily picked person A and not person B. What it means is God picked a method, and the method by which you get saved is you have to have faith. And if you don't have faith, if you don't have faith in the gospel, then what happens? You're not saved. Get with me 1 Timothy Chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So God's desire, His desire is for all men to be saved. The way that they get saved is they have to have faith. So what is the reason that some men aren't saved? Because they've refused to have faith. Look with me at 2 Thessalonians 2.14. 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2 and verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel. How does God call people to salvation today? Does he show them a sign in heaven and he parts the clouds? Does he speak to people through thunderstorms and natural disasters? He calls people by what method? The gospel, right? So how many people does God call? Everyone. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So how many men has God called? All of them. Because he called them by the gospel. The problem is some people don't want to listen. They reject it. Look at me at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1 and 26. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Some people look at that verse and say, well, God only chose to call a couple here and a couple there. No, he called everyone by the gospel. Keep reading. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Notice that no flesh should glory in his presence. What God did is he chose a gospel that 
rejects all of man's self-righteousness and pride. All of his boasting, all of his accomplishments, all of his merit. The gospel says all of that that you're so proud of, you know what it is? It's garbage. It's nothing. It's zero. It's worse than nothing. It's, you know, it's just completely and utterly worthless. How does man typically react to that? Huh. I'm better than that. You don't understand how great I am. And that self-righteousness keeps people from being saved. What's very clear is God has designed the gospel so that it excludes boasting. And what happens, so look at, look, look at verse 26 again. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. You know that can't mean that God only wanted some of the mighty to be saved. Because he wants all men to be saved. 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 and 4 says exactly that. 2 Peter 3, 9 says exa exactly that. 1 John 2, 2 sa says that Christ paid for all the sins of mankind. God wants all men to be saved. What those verses are talking about is what happens to those that are wise and mighty and noble in this life. They reject the gospel. Because verse 29 says, no flesh should glory in his presence. Why does the Lord say to the Pharisees that the publicans and harlots will enter the kingdom of God before you? He says that because they are less likely to glory in their flesh. They're less likely to glory in their own self-righteousness. Does a publican know that he's got problems? Yes. Same with the harlot. I'll say one more thing on that, and then we'll move on to the next question. God desires to save all men, and God will save all men that believe, but he will not save men in their self-righteousness. He won't do it. It's an insult to what Jesus Christ suffered on the cross, and he just won't do it. All right, the, uh, those were all the questions that came in in advance. Does anyone else have a question either online or, uh, yes? So get Acts chapter 16. Verse 30. The question is the phrase, and thy house, in verse 31. Let's just start in verse 30. So the jailer says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, the they is Paul and Silas, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. The phrase, and thy house, causes folks some confusion. Some folks will say, well, here's what that means. When the, the male leader of the house believes, therefore, everyone in the house is saved. Is that true? I mean, that, that's just, I mean, that's just not real, right? That's just, that doesn't make any sense. Look at verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. And then what does it say? And to all that were in his house. So what happens is, what Paul and Silas do is they present the gospel, not simply to the Philippian jailer, but to who else? His house as well. And so they get to individually make their decisions. And then look at verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house, he sat meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God, what does it say? With all his house. So what happened is, and this is the way it should be, <laughs> when Paul went to the house and preached the gospel to the jailer and all those that were in his house, all of them responded appropriately as well they should. Right? And they responded by believing the gospel, and then they, they, they got baptized. 
So that's what that means. It doesn't mean something mystical or, you know, one person gets saved and therefore everyone in their house is automatically saved. It obviously doesn't work like that. Good question. Anything else? Okay, we have some online questions. So the first question is this, 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul tells the Corinthians they would judge the world. This doesn't seem consistent with them, us having a role in heaven, but on earth. So look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I think we actually have a video devoted to this subject. But let's just read verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Now notice verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things pertain that pertain to this life. So what some folks struggle with is they see the word world there, and they see the world they see the word world, and they think earth. Earth is one possible meaning of the word world. But if you look it up in a dictionary, it can also mean the universe, and it can also mean the heavens. Well, guess what meaning it has in, in that passage for the body of Christ? It specifically talks in verse 3 about judging angels. Angels are described as angels of heaven. So what's actually going on there, it's talking about the saints judging the world. It's, it's judging the heavens in the next life is what that's talking about. All right. Next question, 1 Timothy 3.15, 3, 3, is Paul saying that the church is the pillar of truth, as many say, or is he saying that the living God is the pillar of, of truth? Look with me at um, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. 1 Timothy 3.15 But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And, and so I guess the question is, is, is the pillar and ground of the truth a reference to the church or is it a, a, a reference to God? Um, the, thing I, I would, the thing that I think is most helpful in thinking about that question is that Paul has a series of similitudes that he uses. And he talks about people being cast away, shipwreck, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. And, and all of those terms are nautical terms that talk about being at sea and being tossed to and fro to and fro by storms and waves and wind and so on. That's a contrast with Paul talking about being rooted, grounded, the pillar and ground of the truth, established. And so the idea is you have to be established in the faith. And, and, and you do that, you don't want to be you don't want to operate according to the world system because how is Satan described in Ephesians 2.2? He's called the prince of the power of the what? Of the air. And when you compare that with the other nautical metaphors, what it does is it describes people in the world system as being at sea. And if you're a ship at sea at that time, what are you subject to? The wind, right? Blown about with every wind of doctrine. So if you're not, the point being, if you're not established in the faith, 
what happens is you're under the sway, the influence of the prince of the power of the air, and you're just like a little ship that's blown to and fro on the waters. What you need to be is rooted and grounded in the faith. So that, that's, the, you know, that, that's the basic stuff that is going on there. Um, I, I do think that what happens is, this is my own personal opinion, you can decide for yourself. People do not adequately value the local church. And what they do is they will say, well, I'm just as close to God in a canoe out on the water as I am in any church, right? When I'm out with nature, I'm closer to God than I am in any building. And it's this sort of experiential nature experience, and so they don't need to be in a church. You, you, you make decisions for your own spiritual life, but consider this. We are supposed to renew our minds. Our minds are renewed in knowledge, not in sentiment, not in experience. They're renewed in knowledge, meaning that if you're going to be a mature saint, what you have to do is you have to renew your mind in Bible doctrine. And if you fail to do that, you will walk according to the course of this world. Now, here's what happens. You all know this, I, t I take it. Add up during the week how much time the average person spends in church, Sunday school, personal Bible study, and so on. Put that in column A. And column B is YouTube, Netflix, TV, newspapers, news programs. Now, that's column B. Now, which of those columns do you think is bigger for about 99% of the population? Well, that, that's why the church is so worldly. Because the church's thinking is not influenced by this book. It's influenced by the prince of the power of the air. If what I do is I eat this stalk of celery, and it's so good for me, and then I eat 27 bags of Doritos, well... It's nice that I ate this stalk of celery, but my proportion is all wrong, right? If you eat 27 bags of Doritos and one piece of celery, what's going to predominate in your life? You understand the point. Okay, next question. Does Satan really put thoughts in our mind if no, where do the unbidden wrong thoughts that pop into a saved person's mind come from, and what is the best way to deal with them? Ignore them. Get with me 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, the first thing I'll tell you is Satan can't read your mind. He just can't. God the Father can read your mind, but <coughs> Satan can't read your mind. He doesn't know what you're thinking. Now, he might be able to infer what you're thinking. So, for example, if you walk past a store and you throw a rock through the window, he might think that you're intending to commit a crime. You know, I mean, there's some things that, you know, are sort of self-evident. But can Satan read your mind? No, he can't read your mind. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. In the scripture, there is a big difference between being in the flesh and after the flesh. Now, what's being said here is, do you reside in a body of flesh? And the answer is yes. But do you think about things after the flesh? That's a choice. So look with me at verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down, notice what it says here, imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It says they're casting down imaginations. What does Genesis say? about man's imagination. Look at me at Genesis 8, verse 21. Genesis chapter 8, 
verse 21. Now notice, by the way, that this is after the flood. Genesis 8, 21. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. You know what your imagination is? It's evil from your youth. It's just full of evil. And honestly, you know that, don't you? I mean, you've lived with yourself. I mean, if we're being honest, I mean, don't you realize your imagination is evil? What happens is this. Thankfully, you don't act upon every thought you have, right? One of the things, so let me give you this as just a, a simple illustration. One of the things that is part of the maturation process as you go from a child to adult is you learn not to say things that you think. Do children say things like, when you're over at someone's house eating dinner, wow, this tastes awful. Children say things like that. Part of becoming an adult is you realize, yeah, that tastes awful, but I'm not going to say that. Because if I say that, it'll hurt the person's feelings. What's, what, what's my point? My point is that the mere act of becoming an adult is you realize there's a lot of thoughts that I have that I'm not going to act on, right? If you said every thought that occurs in your mind, you wouldn't have any people that have any relationship with you, right? No one would. They would say you're rude. They would say you're unkind. The point of this is, doesn't that give you a window or an illustration into what your thoughts are like? They're, they're evil. They're evil all the time. Thankfully, we don't act on all of them. Now, what does this mean for our spiritual life? Here's what this means. As a saved person, I'm eternally saved, can't lose it. But do I get to choose how I spend my moments? Yes. And I do get to choose where I focus my attention. So when these thoughts come into my mind, and they, they, the imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. It's not Satan, that's our heart, right? That's our sin nature. I have to choose whether I walk in that or not. Look with me at Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 5. Romans 8, 5. For they that are after the flesh, notice what they do. They mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The single most important thing you can do for your own spiritual well-being is to think on the right things. If your mind is carnally minded and you think after the flesh, what are your thoughts going to be full of? Just, just garbage things that will destroy your life. But if you mind the things of the Spirit, you think after the Spirit, your life will be immensely better. Look with me at Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. The idea there is we need to control our, our thought life. 2 Corinthians 10 talked about casting down imaginations. So that, that's what we need to do to control our thought life. It's, um, 
one thing to consider, Satan is evil, wicked, opposes the body of Christ, hates the body of Christ, does all sorts of horrible things. So no, no question about that. And he has a warfare against the body of Christ that involves doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy 4 tells you that. I guess my comment would be, you can blame Satan for the thoughts in your mind, but guess where they came from? Let me put it this way. The voice in your head, who do you think that is? It's you. Right? It's you. Those thoughts come from your sin nature, is what they do. And the person that is responsible for controlling it is you. It just is. And so we need, to, we need to think on the right things is what we need to do. So hopefully that helps. Any other questions anyone has? All right. Well, thank you for the, the questions. As a reminder, we won't meet uh, on Wednesday until the, the, the first week of January. So we look forward to meeting with you again then. Let's go ahead and uh, we'll close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is, is true and it's been preserved. It's without error and it, it is a, it's a safe and reliable authority. We thank you for that. Help us to be growing in knowledge. Help us to be studying and learning and growing. Help us to be more established in the faith. We rejoice in what you've done for us in the gospel. We rejoice in what Jesus Christ has done, and we give him all the glory. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen, saints.